This episode of the MSB Podcast is brought to you by Big Tex Outdoors. Everything you could possibly need for your firearm. If he doesn't have it, you probably don't need it. And Filster Holsters. Can't do a sub-five-second fast drill? We'll get a Filster Holster. If you still can't, well, at least you know it's not the holster's fault. And primary and secondary. The definitive source for the armed professional and the responsible citizen. Quit your bitching about all the rules and get better. Hey guys, welcome to the Modern Samurai Project podcast, nicknamed the Get Better podcast, nicknamed the Self-Reliant podcast. Uh, why do I say Self-Reliant instead of the 2A podcast or some 3% derivation thereof? It's because it's more j- than just about guns, guys. It's about martial arts, it's about fitness, it's about nutrition, it's about medical. Uh, it's being the total self-reliant package because uh, no one's coming to save you. Uh, that being said, the transition to my uh, friend Brian Hill, the name of his company is The Complete Combatant. Uh, so very apropos to have him on my show. Dude, you know how many times like when I'm writing things stuff out, I just want to go, man, you need to be the complete combatant. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a trademark violation there. <laughs> So I got to watch myself on that. But then again, so par from my course, guys, uh, I don't like to do uh, introductions. I like the person to speak for themselves. So, man, uh, tell us a little about yourself, Brian. Uh, my name is Brian Hill. I have been training in martial arts or firearms uh, since uh, 1978. Uh, I started martial arts training. I have followed every decade and every strange philosophy that's come along, whether it's uh, stick fighting or uh, Wing Chun are moving into uh, mixed martial arts. I've done kickboxing. I've done professional mixed martial arts fighting. I've done submission grappling. Uh, I've done Muay Thai. And I've basically done everything that comes along with that. I was in law enforcement for a brief period, which gave me the great ability to direct traffic and uh, tell people <laughs> they shouldn't do things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't a whole lot in that background. And uh, I've been interested in shooting. Uh, I started on an archery team and a rifle team in high school. And then I've been doing shooting more or less. And it got more and more serious as time went on, uh, especially as I began to age out of the the being a full-time professional fighter. Uh, I realized that my self-defense needs were going to be a lot greater than what I could handle just physically. So I wanted to research what would an armed citizen need to defend themselves. And uh, I was lucky to be involved with some really great people in my life, uh, like Claude Warner and Tom Gibbons. And uh, they have led me in a, a pathway that's helped me really grow as a shooter. And I think basically I'm a nonconformist at heart. I want to find out what the answers are wherever they may lie for us. And uh, that has led me on a quest for knowledge continually and anything that'll help me improve or give me a more, uh, a, a greater handle on things is where I go. Okay. Awesome. And then, uh, so again, the name of your, uh, your uh, company is the complete combatant, right? Mm-hmm. You also own a mixed martial arts school. You go ahead and plug that man. All right. It's fusion fitness and mixed martial arts. Okay. Uh, and it, it is a mixture of, truly a mixture of, of striking and grappling. So much like when we started jujitsu in the 90s, there was a lot of striking in it. So uh, we have a submission grappling class that has striking in it. And we have a, a, a striking class that has wall work and takedown defense and, and whatnot. So it's a real combination of uh, the combative arts and that. Awesome. And then, and then what area are you locate? Like, lo- 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 uh, I'm in Kennesaw, Kennesaw, Georgia, which is just north of Atlanta. Just north of Atlanta. Okay, awesome. Um, Atlanta's a hotbed, man. You guys yeah. got uh, the Alliance uh, U.S. headquarters out there with Jacare Cavacanch, uh-huh. man. That's awesome, bro. That's that, that's a that's great. And then you got you know it's also a hotbed for firearms training. I mean, there's there's yourself, Aaron Cowan's out there. There's a couple other dudes I can't remember off the top of my head, but a uh, great hotbed for training out there in the Atlanta area. Yeah, you can't be weak on the jiu-jitsu scene here. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. No, you, you will cannot. not last. <laughs> yeah, you cannot. So that's awesome, man. So, uh, so your progression as a martial artist, right? Because we're we're around the same age. No, no need to tell the audience how old we actually are. <laughs> but we started out the same way, where most of the inspiration of fighting was either magazines like Black Belt, you know, or Kung Fu Magazine. But a lot of it came from movies. You know, and what I'm always interested when someone's around my age, man, is is their first experience the first time they watched uh, the first UFC 
Yeah. What did that do to you? Because were you a grappler at any point in that time in 93, 94? Or, you know, it was VHS times out there, right? So you may have not seen it until 95. Yeah. Right? But we uh, actually, yeah, we watched it live. Oh, did you really? Yeah, one one of my guys, I was teaching traditional karate and Japanese jiu-jitsu at the time, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, there was there was some grappling in it, um, and not to the same degree that we understand grappling with the, the uh, rolling, but we had throws and joint locks and, and holds and whatnot. And one of my students said, hey, we're going to watch this UFC thing. And I had seen the Gracie Underground tapes, yeah. and it, it had always been a concern in the back of my head that something's really going on that I don't have a hold on. Um, because I watched these guys, you know, take a lot of legit martial artists apart pretty easily. And I was like, well, here's a chance to see what's going to happen. And we sat there and watched that. And it was as if the world had had an earthquake in my head because I said, everything just changed. Yep. And I had a business partner and he had the exact opposite part, uh, idea. He was like, nothing will ever change from here on out. This is not what we're going to do. So <laughs> it made a little bit of a problem in our business, of course. Uh, we begin to, you know, bifurcate in our ideas of training. Uh, and then a friend of mine called me and he said, hey, listen, I got this guy doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu because you remember when UFC happened, you couldn't find anybody to to learn Brazilian jiu-jitsu from. Uh, oh, no. A blue belt oh, was a god. A god. You know? Oh, 100 yeah. percent. There was a guy in Florida we go to train with that was a blue belt. So it's hard for people to imagine that you wanted to go train with somebody, you know, that distance away. But my buddy called me, said, hey, I got a guy coming down. I didn't even ask. I said, all right, I'll be there. It was a three-day seminar, and it was Hicks and Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> so, Welcome. Yeah. Well, I had somebody else that did the yeah. same thing. In one, and I can't remember who that was, man. But, uh, oh, I think it was Paul Sharp. It was Paul yeah. Sharp. They had yeah. that thing. It's like your, your first seminar is with Hicks and Gracie. You know, and it was it was an odd thing as a traditional martial artist because this guy was friendly. He was personable. Uh, he came and introduced himself. He's like, you know, you just call me Hickson. And at the end of the seminar, he also rolled with about 50 of us in a row and smoked all of us. Um, yeah. You know, and he, did, it was. Did, did he use his hands or not? Yeah, sometimes he did. You know, <laughs> was, yeah. He, but he really, it was the first time I'd seen a real master of martial arts yeah. that could just take everybody and say, hey, I'm going to do this. And even more interesting, uh, my friend was running a kickboxing academy. So afterwards, he said, well, let's just go in the ring and I'll spar with you guys, no takedowns. So he went in and sparred with some really top ranked guys and yeah. was very serviceable in the sparring area, too. So uh, there was two lessons involved in that, that, hey, listen, you know, the ground fighting is important, but this guy can strike, too. So, Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, it's interesting when you start hopping on uh, each uh, discipline and things of that nature. And we always, you know, heard that, you know, like 95 percent of fights go to the ground. And empirically for me, that was absolutely the case. But then you have to back up and go, well, about 100 percent of fights start standing up. Yeah. You know, uh, unless you're sitting down, you know, but, but anyway, uh, so we forget about those things either. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was a traditional uh, sort of martial artist, right? I was laughing. People call Taekwondo a traditional martial art since it's only really been in the state since the 70s, 80s. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, back then it was like, what's that? Karate? No, it's Koreans, bro. Anyway, uh, and even that has completely changed over time, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, so many things to unpack in there that I find super interesting and we're going to get it to gun guys. Don't worry. I'm going to tie this into the gun <laughs> thing in just a little bit. Right. So the partner that you had where your eyes were opened up, right. And that nagging guy or that nagging voice in the back of your mind saying, Hey man, I used to know wrestlers in high school and they used to fuck everybody up. You know, I was just saying, like, who do, who would you never mess with in high school? You know, yep. when the football players, when the baseball players, when the basketball players, you never fucked with the wrestlers, you know, and as a traditional stand up, you know, you do some throws, you need some kind of some takedowns, blah, blah, blah. But mostly you were going to punch or kick a dude in the face. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, or the sciatic nerve or some shit like that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but then that nagging thing in the background, mm. man, that dude with those messed up ears, man. I don't I don't know. Let's uh. Let's let's watch another Chuck Norris movie and get over <laughs> that, right? Um, what was what was his take on it though? Why will he go? This is nothing. It will never change. Where you had such an uh, uh, an epiphany moment there. I think you probably encounter this with shooters a lot. Uh, some people are structured in a certain way that 
they have built this this castle and it's yeah. very hard to change it and in order to change it they'd have to tear it down and it's an indeed and a frightening thing and we were very high level by then um, you know, we had a lot of respect in the organization. We we're top teachers. And basically what I was saying is, you know, we got to start over. And what he was saying is, no, we're going to double down on what we're going to do. Uh, this is, this is the way, this is, this is the path. And I think, you know, this is really personality driven. Do you like the answer? Um, and if you don't like the answer, then let's just stick with what we got. I don't want to change anything. And that's, you know, basically been your path with red dots and appendix care. Yep. Yep. You know? Um, yep. every time that we hear we're going to shoot our junk off and that you can't find the dot, you know, I know you must cringe on the inside. It, it, we specialize so much and sometimes in martial arts that we forget what was the, the, the gist of the reason we started was be able to fight anybody that came along, not just the ones that were good at our particular aspect of it. So I just think, you know, to this day, he still teaches the same thing. Um, I don't know how much it's evolved. But, um, you know, he's a very high level martial martial artist and he's a good dude. And that's that was his path. But, um, you know, he got more disciplined in the traditional martial arts and I went and just tried everything. And it created a lot of friction in our organization eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting stuff. And, you know, and that absolutely happened in in different parts of uh, I think that's a microcosm of what happened in the rest of of the martial arts community for a while. I don't even think that things like jujitsu was allowed in Thailand for a while. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and now it's, you know, some of the best Muay Thai fighters or some of the best jujitsu MMA yeah. fighters out there. Uh, for a while, I believe the same thing was in Korea. Korea has a huge MMA seed now. If you look at guys like Ben Henderson that mixed Taekwondo and Jiu Jitsu and won championships with karate, and you know, you have guys like Leo to Mashida that also won championships mm -hmm. and the seamless, you know, and then and then you know, uh, 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 uh Anderson Silver as well, just the seamless integration because fighting is fighting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and it depends on where you go. You know, I always say hashtag everything's jujitsu because the body works the way the body yeah. works, including pistol shooting. Right. Mm -hmm. So where I'm getting at with all that is what is your take, man? Because I, I, I don't know if you and I talked about this. I think we did. But I know I had this conversation with Matt Little, uh, who's another, you know, uh, longtime martial artist and Paul Sharp. Uh, I see a lot of similarities, especially with pistol shooting today to the epiphanies we're having 93 94 95 you know when the ufc came out and everything kind of all, all the fundamentals and paradigms and dogma kind of got put on its ear i think we're at the same place now but i want to hear your thoughts on that what are your thoughts on that yeah i i see a lot of similarities um you know, training is rather bifurcated into certain camps or personalities or certain uh, platforms or certain competitions. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity right now in the firearms industry to break this cyclic tradition. Mm -hmm. And it is a cyclic tradition. I just went to Tom Givens' uh, uh, reunion uh, for Range Masters instructors, and he presented 100 years of training. And it's funny. Uh, he had videos or pictures of people in the 1930s standing in isosceles using both hands, yeah, using their front sights. So, you know, we've done all this before. We take it apart. We try to isolate things. We try to specialize. Then we realize that eventually that isolation leads us into just incestuous training where we only train against mm. people that do the same thing. And then we lose the context of, of what it really is we're trying to do. I think right now, um, there's a lot of good instructors, you're, you being one of them, that are kind of pushing that edge and saying, hey, listen, you know, there's a lot of value in competition. There's a lot of value in being uh, tactical, you know, and as Gabe uh, likes to call it, be a technical Timmy instead of a tactical Timmy, yep. you know, develop this this whole thing, this, this whole process. Uh, I think it's human nature that we kind of throw a bunch of stuff away and we think, oh, God, this is the first time any of this has ever been done and there's nothing to be put back together or learned or put, you know, in, improved upon. And uh, the parallels are daunting because one thing martial arts does is if the founder dies, then what they do is they, they take their curriculum and they, they solidify it, codify it, never changes again. So yeah. from that point on, the art is dead. 
Yeah. Because it can't grow anymore. We have done that with the military and law enforcement pistol training for for decades now. This is how we've always done it. This is how you do everything. This the equipment won't change, and it's very slow to adjust. And once the bureaucracy of an organization gets a hold of that, um, you know, it takes somebody to come along and shake it up and say, "Hey, listen, you're really missing something." And I'm able to do things that you're not able to do. That's what happened in martial arts, and that's what I see happen in pistol training right now. And it's really funny that how attached people get to their tradition. Uh, you know, honor the people who went before us. They had some great ideas. Uh, if it wasn't for Higuero Kano, you know, we wouldn't be here rolling because he came up with a great idea. Hey, you yep. can you can do this without dying, you know, you yeah. tap out. And that's what made all the difference in the world. Uh, I don't think he's probably the first guy to ever think of that. But, you know, we've kept it and we evolve. And from now on in the, the martial arts community, we know what kicks and punches look like. We know what grappling looks like. And it's very hard to sell anybody in the world on anything else because they have a right. baseline knowledge of what it should look like. And I think we're starting to see that. What does a good shooter look like? Uh, it's really easy to point at it, much like the Supreme Court said about pornography. I don't know what it is, but I know when it when I see it. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. a guy's not good, you look at him and you go, that's not very good. You know, he's not able to perform. And uh, I think we're seeing a performance level uh, that requires people to be very efficient and good at what they do now is in the firearms industry. So we're putting it all back together again, and hopefully we can hold on to it and pass it on to the next group and they can improve it too. I'll make it a better, better thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with modern technology, the internet, the, uh, the ability for people to explain, express their opinions, uh, yeah. right, wrong, or indifferent. I think that, uh, changes can happen quickly and bad changes, uh, don't stick, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so so two things when 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 Tom was doing that, and I would love to take that class just to see. But uh, did he show anybody from like the 1800s and learning 1900s carrying appendix? Yeah. Because they because they did. Yep. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they did, right? <laughs> and then the other one is the uh, misinterpretation through the proliferation of Weaver, of yeah. the Weaver stance. Right. Uh, who's I talking? Oh, I was like, I was talking to John Murphy about that, right? About how Colonel Cooper said and wrote down, uh, Weaver never stood with his arm, with his feet pointed in the uh, east west when his body was north south. He never did that. Stop doing that. Right. <laughs> or the thing of why he shot with one arm bent, one arm straight is because Jack Weaver had nerve damage in his left arm. Yeah. Right. Those things can quickly get out there now and clarify. But back then it was books maybe magazines you mm -hmm. know and how that misinterpretation of a technique basically influenced mm -hmm. decades of military and law enforcement training based on that yeah you know and now if you go to what you and i would call a, a fighter stance you know if you're right-handed left leg forward both arms out now mm -hmm. that's called modified weaver <laughs> by some people i'm like huh no dude that what Whatever. Well, look at look at us in jujitsu. You know, uh, I don't know if you remember when the Darce choke came out. Yep. Nobody could really figure it out at first. Mm -hmm. Now, if you perform a submission and you're at ADCC, you're at the Pan Am Games. Three weeks later, everybody in every gym knows how to do it if they want to. Right. You know, where it right. took us years to figure out techniques and trends. Uh, if you went to a tournament and some, I remember when Ryan Hall was hitting triangles so hard. Yep. Um, you know, it took a while, almost a year for everybody to figure out what was happening. If I don't watch every top level competitor now and send my guys to, a, you know, fight in an absolute division, they're going to get slaughtered. Yeah. Because yeah. the change is so quick. You know, if you don't do leg locks now as a black belt, well, you're in trouble, you know, and these changes are quick. And, 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 and here, and here's the thing about that, right? You, you look at the rise of like, uh, the Danaher death squad, you yep. know, and I mean, dude, really leg locks yeah in even the late 2000s right uh not the late 2000 but 2000 i'm too late 2000s 2009 2010 to, yeah there was an ankle lock maybe there was yep. a toe hold right no gi was basically you know wrestlers that didn't want to put on a gi and just maul people blah 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 but now you know between like the start of it with uh, Dean Lister and then you uh, Osamar Polaris and then the Danaher Death Squad man um, you know the uh, uh, the Ryan brother just if you don't know leg locks mm -hmm. right 
and all that stuff, you know, that'll get you killed in the street. Deep half car to get you killed in the street. Leg locks, blah, blah, blah. And now if you don't know it, yeah. hey, bro, guess what? Someone's going to pop your ankle, pop your knee, you know? And uh, so. It's interesting with Dan or her, too. He's a very traditional guy. You know, yeah. when you listen to his teaching, he's using traditional Japanese language. He's using yep. traditional fundamentals. But he's just taken the principles that work and applied them to what we're doing now. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's that's really the answer to your question is, you know, what did, did my partner and I miss? Uh, take take the fundamentals, take the things that do work and that are a part of this because they've been passed on and apply them to what we have now. And you've got a real, real potent aspect to it. And you have a system and structure that allows you to progress. Right. A hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. So. What are your, so I know you compete, but, and, yep. you know, and I know your guys in the martial arts compete. I know you, yep. but what, why, why is that important though? Right. Why is that important to you? To keep us honest. Okay. I mean, it's really the bottom line. It keeps me honest as a coach. If my guys go out and uh, they don't compete well, that falls back on me. Um, you know, if an individual doesn't do well and we have a problem, we work on that. But if we see a consistent pattern of, you know, I send 10 competitors and, you know, we have a, an 80 percent loss rate, something's incredibly long. So that's a, uh, some sort of impetus for us to change and to improve and to look at our, our criteria. And that's what pressure testing of it does. But also, more importantly, from competition, we get the ability to learn to manage pressure. Yep. And that's what's missing in a lot of firearms training is the management of pressure. How does a a competitive or a performance mode, as Steve Anderson likes to call it. How does it mm -hmm. work under pressure? How can we apply these fundamentals when another human being's been training for eight weeks to stop us? Or when the timer goes off and time becomes compressed into tenths of seconds where you have to make strong decisions, the pressure of competition uh, allows the elite athlete to pass on that structured mechanism of performance goals to everybody in the gym. And every time we have a competition, we spend eight weeks getting ready for it. And that makes you better in itself because it's not the competition that made you better. It's the getting ready for it. And then you go to the competition, see what your current level of skill is. If it's insufficient, we come back and fix it. So we're always in a cycle of renewal instead of a cycle of status or hold or okay. possibly decay, you know? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I you know, uh, I say this, but it's been said a you know, million times before I, I stole it from my professor is that, you know, you will learn more about yourself in one, in one tournament yeah. And then you will learn Then you learned about yourself in the past three months of training. Yeah. You know, you know who you are when you get on the mat. Right. Just like, you know, who you are when you step onto the stage, you know, yeah. or shoot a drill or a standard in a class uh, or something like that. So let's, let's take a, in your philosophy, because so on the firearm side of training, uh, you offer everything from concealed carry through, you know, pistol one, you know, all the way through, you know, I, I haven't looked at the other parts of yeah. your catalog. I just like watching your, your videos and stuff like that. What, what is your catalog as far as beginning to end? If a person wanted to want to take that stuff, you know, I come into this backwards because I came in through the force on force. Okay. Uh, most people come in through building of technical skills mm -hmm. uh, with the firearm. So I came in backwards so the problems presented themselves as, uh, you know, what happens? How do we see danger? How do we recognize it? How do we manage danger? How do we use our verbal skills? Uh, how do we develop actually our, our fighting skills? Um, how do we react to it? And what do we do immediately afterwards? How do we call 911? How do we interact with the police? What are the legal ramifications of our use of force? So my, my whole catalog covers those areas. Uh, the complete combatant course, which is now force readiness, is a force on force class that has some some martial arts in it but basically it has a bunch of pressure and it makes you make all those decisions and access all the tools that you're willing to carry and then be able to justify yourself uh, then i teach an entry level pistol which i think is the most important one because i think your first lesson should be your greatest lesson ever mm. um, you know, think about my first Brazilian jiu-jitsu lesson, with, you know, with Hickson. Nobody can ever take that away from me. I knew what jiu-jitsu looks like, you know, and I felt it. So having a very good instructor take the time and spend four hours with you as a new instructor is really important. Then we have, you know, um, 
Pistol Essentials and Beyond Pistol Essentials, which is basically, you know, diagnostic fundamentals and building a shooter. And then we add movement. You know, it's the same thing everybody does because shooting, shooting, there's only so many aspects to it. Uh, but we make it in uh, uh, the time standards harder, the movement harder. Uh, we add verbal skills. We add, uh, you know, different draw positions with hands, uh, different ways to get to your pistol. Uh, we do time standards on it as we, we progress. So, Everything that an armed citizen needs to do, that's the only thing I teach. I'm not really a law enforcement or military teacher. I, I teach the concealed pistol, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's what's important to me. And so that's where we're, where does it go and how does it work with all the other skills at the same time? Okay, awesome. So let's take, let's draw two parallels, right? So you have a 20 year old person, right? Mm -hmm. They're healthy, no physical ailments, you know, they're not broken like you and I are. And then, uh, and, uh, <laughs> From, they they go on the martial arts side of your uh, of your uh, uh, expertise, right? When are they ready to compete? You know, so uh, it, that's a hard answer. Um, what is that person like mentally? What is their background, right? You know, if if a guy has wrestled in high school, he may be ready to to compete pretty quickly. We plug in some technical skills. Um, if it's somebody who came out of you know uh, a tough background and has some uh, drama and trauma in his life, he may compete pretty quickly. Also, if you've never had that and you're a real technical guy and we spend some time, they're pretty good. I try to get people to compete as soon as I can, um, okay. where they're technically sound. Um, you know, and when I mean technically sound, I start to see the resemblance of movement of the martial art inside of it. It may mm. not be perfect yet, but you know, I see them starting to react and recognizing what's going on. So it's not an overwhelming process. Uh, that they have somewhat of a breath pattern as they fight, which is really important. Yeah. And you know. that's right. I don't care how I don't care how shape you're in. If you can't, if you don't breathe, yeah. don't matter. <laughs> you know. And then we've done some basic conditioning with you. We've gotten you a little stronger. Uh, we've worked on your speed, your agility, your flexibility, and your endurance in class. Because the greatest way to get ready for fighting is fighting. Yep. Um, you know. Yep. And once I start seeing health and a good recognition of, of, of fighting skills, I think it's time for you to go. But some people come to my gym, they never compete, you know, um, but they do. They just don't right. realize it. I just hide it inside of the curriculum now. Okay. Um, but, you know, most of them get excited and they see a couple guys do well and then it starts, the itch in the back of the head starts, you know, I really should go try that. I want to find out who I am. And uh, it, it's a very interesting process to watch people get that itch and think, hmm, you know, I can go do this. And it's interesting. Sometimes it's not the 20 year old healthy guy gets the itch first. You know, it's a 45 year old guy that's been asking himself the whole his whole life. I wonder what I'm like under pressure, man. Yeah, yeah what exactly. am I going to do? Yeah. yeah. So let's draw that parallel to, uh, you know, your pistol student, which there is a lot less of them having a previous background unless they were you know law yep. enforcement or mill but we're talking yep. about your 20 year old right yep. um you know that 20 year old on the martial arts side they could have maybe they had some form of striking before or they watched a rocky movie or yep. you know they wrestled in high school something like that it's much less common for your average pistol student to have some sort of previous experience with it yep. so so what do you what do you do with them when do you start telling them hey you need to think about competing. Yeah. I know you do this too. You create parallels in their, their training environment yeah. with things that they've already mastered. Mm -hmm. um, it, somebody's done something in their life and they're usually pretty decent at it. And once we start drawing connections to that, we can shortcut the teaching process. Instead of, I've got to rebuild you, there's a bunch of stuff in there that works and let's get rid of the things that don't work. Yep. So, it, you know, it's very simple. I find pistol training one of the most simple things to do as far as a mechanical, out, uh, you know, application. It's, you know, if you can point, you can pretty much do this. Um, but the problem is how fast can you process? Uh, that's where we start seeing the issues in this because, you know, as fast as martial arts fighting is, um, there's a, a, a locus of focus that happens because you're under pressure. Somebody's trying to choke you. Somebody's kicking and punching you. Mm -hmm. With firearms, we have to create that artificially with a timer or a series of qualification drills or whatever. Where we start compressing time and we demand that they see faster and think faster. Um, yep. And once we start seeing there, there's some automaticity, some subconscious competence in their movements, and they can do all the gun handling administratively 
without much thought, I think they're pretty ready for competition at that point because then it's just basically going and, you know, calling your shots and making sure you did a good job. But, you know, once you can do a good draw and you can do a good reload, and I know statistically in self-defense we don't see a lot of reloads, but if you're going to compete, you got to reload. If you're going to go to the range and shoot, you got to reload also. So, you know, those basic skills of being able to shoot around cover and to move your feet and to draw the pistol doesn't take an incredibly long time. Um, and then the nice thing with most of the, you know, USPSA, IDPA, they're very welcoming to beginners. They walk mm-hmm. them through it. They take them to the site, you know, and they show them how this works. And as long as the ego doesn't get uh, crushed so it can't recover, you know, you realize pretty quickly, hey, there's some people over there that are in worse shape than I am, and they're much better shooters. And once again, we see that, all right, let's go back to the drawing of our own proof. So, uh, you know, as soon as I see competent gun handling, which is pretty soon in the process, if people will apply deliberate practice to it, I think, you know, three to six months, you can see a pretty proficient shooter that could go and shoot, you know, a standard IDPA match or USPS match and get something out of it and move ahead. It doesn't take long. Yeah. Um, and it gives them something to hold on to, something to look forward to, something to train. Absolutely. So let's get a little bit back in, in, in your journey. I know you said you were on the archery and uh, rifle team um, in, in high school, but as far as pistol work goes, when did you really get uh, started in becoming you know, a student of the pistol? Uh, I was very fortunate. I had a guy come into my school and uh, he had a shooting school shirt on. I was like, what's that about? And he was kind of cryptic. Uh, he was a former uh, in the Marine Corps, and he'd done a lot of counterterrorism work, security work. So he was pretty decent with a pistol. And he said, ah, oh, you know, I do a little bit with a pistol. And, you know, just jokingly, as most martial arts guys, you know, uh, you know, I do martial arts, I'd like to go shooting. And he said, all right, we'll do a class, you know, I'll bring everybody out and we can shoot one day. So I was just thinking some ad hoc thing. And uh, the gentleman put on the most uh, professional one day shooting course for free I've ever seen in my life huh. you know, from medical brief uh, because he'd been teaching. Uh, he'd already been, you know, he taught with several professional groups. So he just really taught us from the basic. And, and once again, my world split a little bit. And I said, Hey, listen, there's professional instruction in the firearms community. I didn't know this existed. Um, in the eighties, I took a, you know, Masada U lethal force Institute class, but I hadn't really followed up. I hadn't seen the growth in the pattern and he introduced me to that. So I, immediately attached to his hip and became his apprentice and forced him into teaching professionally as much as I could, you know? (laughs) So I got an apprenticeship out of it, which Mm -hmm. was fantastic. And then, um, you know, we went from there, we started growing and I had a desire to compete, uh, which wasn't really his forte. And, uh, then I had a desire to train with greater, you know, uh, different instructors and greater programs and push myself higher and higher. Um, so you know, it was one simple thing. A guy walked into my jiu-jitsu gym and I asked him about his t-shirt and it renewed my my interest in firearms and made me realize that, hey, there's a real growing community of professional instructors that you can get quick skills from. It's not enough just to shoot pretty well, you know, because I was a good good enough shooter. You've heard this story yep. before. Yep. You know, in law enforcement, man, if you can shoot 100, you're nearly a god anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, so it wasn't much of a problem to do that. The time constraints and qualifications are next to nothing. Um, you know, there's really not a whole lot of that. So seeing that there was the same thing that I loved in martial arts and the firearms community was just a godsend. It was such a blessing to get that, to walk into my gym. And, you know, they always say when you're ready, the teacher shows up and man, that was the moment. Yeah. That's all. That's an awesome story, man. Like, um, John Danaher says that, uh, in his videos and, and one of his, uh, ads or something like that that you know he he firmly believes in the power of a person coming into your life for a mm-hmm. brief moment in time and changing it right yeah, that was dean talk- lister wasn't it, it was dean lister <laughs> yeah. yeah about he's like you know when he was talking about leg locks you know why would you ignore half of the human body <laughs> and that change and just think about from that statement the state Mm-hmm. of martial arts, MMA, jiu-jitsu right now just from that statement. And, you know, Dean Lister's a guy that, man, he's been around forever, that people yeah. don't celebrate uh, mm-hmm. his contributions enough. Celebrate. That sounded kind of weird, but I think that's an apropos verb, right? Anyway. Uh, you don't put the soundtrack on him, man. <laughs> then there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, you, so okay, so that now we know why that's important, right, uh, for you and why you started switching the pistol work, but... You've been starting to push a lot more 
um, in the time that I've known you. Am I right or wrong about that? You've always, uh, yes. but there seem, you know, just in like yep. the videos of, of watching you, because, you know, I kind of followed you before you and I had met and um, you were, <sighs> how can I, how can I put this? I can, there's always like, when, when, when people come to my class or I train with them or I'm at a class there, I can always tell the guy there is like this, how can I put this? There is this steely eyed focus, right? Of I'm going to figure this shit out, mm -hmm. right? And I am going and, and nothing is going to stop me. So let's do this. And you had that look. You had that look in your eye. And that's what gets me fired up about yeah. stuff, right? I go like, oh, this guy wants to be better than me. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Is that something new? Have you always had that? You know, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but no, you're, you're right. Um, obsession may be the right word. You know, uh, same thing in martial arts. Hey, I wanted to be better. So where do I go? Well, I fight at the regional level, then I fight at the national level, then I fight at the world level. And what you realize is that with the proper training, all, all things become possible. Yeah. And what I was simply lacking in the firearms training is I didn't know how to get to the next step. Uh, I had gotten to a place that, you know, as being a disciplined, structured person was actually hindering me where, you know, um, I was prone to accuracy, less than speed, you know, and I was taught if you can shoot the wings off the net, you're good. Uh, so I avoided speed mode at all cost, mm -hmm. you know, and I started realizing when I went to competition where I could go shoot a whole match zero points down or y whatever. I was way down in the standings because I was really slow. Um, something was wrong. How am I going to get better? And it was once again, the competition that forced me to confront myself and my own failings as, as a, a shooter is that I'm missing something here and I've got to go get it. And I think that's probably the biggest change for people is that moment right there. You can either ignore it and you say, I'm good enough, or you can go and find coaches that are going to make you better. And that's exactly what happened. And when I met you for your class, uh, it was just the perfect part of that year because I'd been doing pretty well in competition. Then I signed up for your course. Uh, I met you and you were just what I needed an instructor because you were, you were more of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor. You were yeah. personable. You know, you, you wanted to talk. You really wanted to be interested in what we were doing. It wasn't leading a class, you know, where I got, hey, you should put your finger here, you should do that. It was, Brian, you're going to do this and you're going to get better now. And I can show you how to do it. We're going to do it together and we can push it even harder than you want to. And then immediately after that, I had Steve Anderson's class. Yeah. Which was another, oh, yeah, you, you think you're fast now. Watch what's really possible in the world. And, you know, I, I always go back to Supercross. Nobody could do a backflip on a motorcycle. It was impossible. Right. You can't even get into Supercross unless you can do a backflip now. Yeah. You know, what is ours? The sub-second draw? Yeah. You know, nobody can draw the gun quickly and get a good hit and make a decisive uh, shooting motion with it. You know, you're just point shooting. But yeah, now, exactly. I mean, you're this not is aiming. just commonplace. You're not aiming. Yeah. And you're a metric-driven guy. You know, if you're a metric-driven driven guy, if you know what is possible and you start asking – you know, you start going up this funnel and I know you did this yeah. where, you know, there's pretty good guys and you start being as good as they are. And then you go to the next guys and you go to the next guys and you get to that last, you know, top echelon of shooters like Max Michelle and Ben Steger and people that train like Steve Anderson yourself. They start pushing for this performance that is at the limit of human beings ability, but it's possible. And that's where the passion comes from. That's where the I've got to be better than I was yesterday. You know, when I came to your class, I just wanted to be a better incarnation of who I am tomorrow than I am mm. today. And that's the only reason to get up every day and train is I got to be better. Yeah. And, and, and I appreciate yeah. the I appreciate the kind words. That's, that's a lot because. Uh, when I um when I look at instructors. Uh, I generally don't really care about their background. Mm -hmm. You kind of have you kind of have to. Because you want to make sure, well, you know, this dude just, you know, hopped off the NRA instructor, you know, yeah. uh, 
five day course or whatever like that. And he's teaching his first class. I think I'm going to pass on that guy. So you got to look at the resume a Mm. little bit and what the guy has accomplished. But once you get past that part, you know, and with so much with marketing and media and and things of that nature, you can get a good feel about how a person teaches. And I remember watching the one video of you uh, or a number of videos of you that you do when you're with your short little uh, uh, snippets from your class. And then the one from Tacon, which was a bit longer, Mm. right? I think it was the one that actually uh, John Correa posted on active self-protection extra and me right on that one (laughs) he did well you did yourself right yeah you did yourself right because um it is it is hard for me to watch a five minute video (laughs) with with no shooting in it (laughs) right for a lot of us it is for Mm -hmm. a lot of us it is i got other stuff to do and uh, the eloquence in which you had talked to your students in that time uh, was w- was fantastic. It really was. It really was fantastic. And it made me think about, man, do I talk too fast when I'm teaching, you know, and can I be a little bit uh, more measured to make sure that message is 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 coming through? Uh, and I and I enjoyed that, man. So whenever you can look at another instructor and go. I need to look at my own stuff to see if I can do it that well. Uh, I, I think that's a, you know, uh, that's a kudo directly from me to you Thank on you. that. Uh, Cause I didn't, I didn't very much enjoy the, your, your videos, especially that one. Um, you know, something to say to that. I've been, I'm probably one of the only guys that has been teaching privately his whole life. I always true. run the school. Yeah. So mathematically I've done it. I've got a hundred thousand hours of teaching. So yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's a tremendous bonus. It doesn't matter what I'm teaching. Cause I teach strength training. I teach striking. I teach jujitsu. I teach firearms. I teach combatives. I do all that. Teaching's teaching. It's yeah. connection and putting the student first that matters. Right. You know, and that's something you did very well. And it was refreshing because I hadn't, um, I I've, there's some very good teachers in the firearms communities, but they're pretty far and few between that know how to teach. You know, there's a lot of good shooters. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and sometimes I can watch them and get something, but somebody that will actually speak to me and make a connection with me. That's, that's, that's important. So. Yeah. And you know what? It, it was interesting. Cause you're the first one that actually told me, it's like, bro, that was just like a jujitsu seminar. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Oh, you're right. <laughs> I wonder where I got that shit from. You're all, <laughs> yeah. you well, know, you know I- I got injured. I've got a groin injury. So pretty much all jujitsu is off the table for the last six weeks. Yeah. And I have to teach by words alone. Yeah. My God, is it hard to teach oh, jujitsu by dude. talking? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. impossible. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and that, there's an important lesson there. It's not impossible because yeah. you're a good teacher because yeah. you can do it physically. You just, you're, but that gets into how do firearms instructors who don't demo right. do this? First oh, of all, it's thing. boring. <laughs> yeah. First of all, it's boring. Yeah. Who wants to stand on the range for one or two days and not shoot? Mm-hmm. That's why would you do that? And could you imagine on the uh on the martial arts side of this going to a seminar and the guy didn't demo? Used to exist though. You know, think well, of the that's because if I yeah, yeah. It's because you know yeah. I can't truly show you the dim mock because then you'd be dead in three days. Yeah. You know, but uh that I mean nowadays, yeah. That's can't do not, it. Yeah, and that'll be that'll spread like wildfire. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so awesome. So what's the next level for you, my man? What are your goals? Uh, this year, every year I set a goal. So last year was uh, speed and the red dot, uh, which worked really well together. Um, and it was funny. I was I got into the red dot because it was showing up in class. Mm-hmm. And how can I be a legitimate instructor if I don't understand a platform that's coming through and people using a system that I don't understand? And I started shooting it. And I think martial artists have this experience with the red dot. Oh, that looks like fighting. You know, it's yeah. not, it moves a lot. It gives me a lot of information. It talks to me yeah. in a way. It's not structured like those, those hard iron sights. So man, I really kind of like that thing. And, um, and then we worked on speed. So at the beginning of this year, uh, Tom Gibbons offered his master level instructors course. Mm-hmm. So I took the advanced instructors course two weeks ago. I took his revolver course cause that's a part of the master instructor course. And I'd still get revolvers in class. And I have to shoot them. And I'm old enough to have carried a revolver, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> but this year was motion and mastery. Uh, I wanted to find the mastery at the edge of my performance, um, what I'm capable of. 
So I'm really, I haven't been able to compete to the level I wanted to compete this year because you know how it goes once you start teaching full time. Uh, competition is very hard to work in. Um, but I want to work on my mastery level skills, um, which is, you know, that final 10%. Uh, yep. The 90% is there. You pushed me on that. You know, your standards are pretty good as a, a solid mastery level skill. If you can shoot your black belt course, that's a pretty solid mastery level skill. Uh, so I took Gabe's class this year. Uh, worked on it, you know, missed my turbo pen, but uh, was much closer this year than last year. So I felt a big improvement in my performance. So the rest of the year is uh, where's the final inefficiencies in my ability that I can imp improve upon and get that little bit of, uh, I want to integrate speed mode so that it's mine and I don't fight it all the time. Yep. Yep. You know? Uh, that it's on demand. I've seen you do that with your, you know, you had your breakthrough videos and then mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I'm shooting a class. It's no big deal. And I, I've recognized the same thing in myself where I'll be dead cold and, you know, we'll do a, all right, we're going to do your draw and, and measure the time, you know, and I'll hit a 0.9, no problem. And it feels slow. So, you know, that means the speed levels being incorporated into my personality. Now it's becoming natural and normal to be faster and quicker. And I had a Taekwondo instructor that did a tremendous amount of damage to me psychologically. He told me I was mm. slow and I'd never be fast. And uh, I accepted that because I respected him greatly. And I probably held that in my my fighting system and my personality my whole life. So this is a big year for me to to push to master level and to become the best shooter I can be for my students and to understand the, you know, the level. So, yeah. Was that Taekwondo instructor Korean? Yeah, he was. Yeah, because that's a yeah. very Korean thing to say. It is. I can say that, y'all. I got I got you know, slant, funny I got slant eyed privilege anyway. We still wanted to be legitimate when we first started teaching in Taekwondo. Several of us had Korean accents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, we talked yeah. like he would because we <laughs> wanted to imitate him. <laughs> That's just a thing, right? Yeah. Even like Blonde hair, blue eye guy with a Korean accent, man. Dude, in Brazilian <laughs> Jiu Jitsu, it's like, yeah. it's like, hey, man, for sure, 100%. <laughs> you know, put the cape out of you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just a, it, you get immersed into the culture. Appeal you know, to authority. <laughs> yeah, you get appeal to authority. I mean, I mean, how long did it how long did it take you after like your first three tactical firearms classes did you start saying Roger all the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's just a thing. It's yeah. right, wrong, or indifferent. You want to immerse into the culture and and you know, uh I do think it helps. I yeah. do think it helps, you know. Um, except for the Brazilian part being late all the time. Don't do yeah, that. No good. No good. No bueno. <laughs> no. <laughs> um Awesome. So, uh, so cool. So who are you seeking out for the, for the mobility part, man, for the movement part? Have you thought uh, about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, looking at the mobility part. That's kind of an odd aspect of this. Um, you know, Steve Anderson gave me some good keys to it, uh, in his class with the movement off, uh, you know, conf as soon as you call the shot being ready to move. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a pretty good sports background in it, but I'm unsure with the movement of where to go. Um, you know, oh. I've just been incorporating it into my dry practice so that, you know, I, I do, as you've, you know, you and I are going to sell more Steve Anderson books than anybody, <laughs> I think. you know, but I've taken repetition refinement. Everything's in motion all the time uh, yep. when I don't have a groin injury. So I don't know. I mean, if you have a suggestion in yes. that area, that would I be do. awesome. I, I do. And, I, and I'll, and I'll, uh, it, it's a good way to relate this information out to the, uh, to the yep. audience as well. So uh, low hang, not, I shouldn't say low hanging fruit, easy to find class yeah. from people who teach all the time. Um, and everybody knows I'm friends with the guy, but I, I will tell you that Tim Heron's class, yeah. uh, is it's amazing. Right. And you know, we've had our conversations, man. I don't throw around amazing liberally at all. Yeah. Really ever. Right. So when I say that you will get better uh, in really all aspects of gun handling, uh, mm -hmm. focusing on competition, uh, Tim, Tim's herring classes is, is very easy. Uh, it's an easy choice, right? Plus, he's just such an awesome guy. Man, I love his podcast, too. Yeah. Uh, if you have a chance to uh, train with Ben Steger, you should. Um, his movement, uh, what, what he teaches in movement and the way he motivates you, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's some people that motivate with pats on the back and there's some people who reach into your soul and punch it. 
uh, <laughs> Ben is the guy that does that. For example, with me, we were doing one drill. Uh, I won't go into the to the aspects of it, right? But his whole thing is you need to give maximum effort, right? And when you do so, you will usually make a grunt. Like the first time you hit a heavy dead, your heaviest deadlift, yeah, yeah. PR, you're like, Argh! right? He's like, you should be making that noise when you move, right? So I did one, and he goes, did you give me your maximum effort? I'm like, uh, yeah, man, but I got bad knees. And he goes, you keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Yeah, that stuck with you. Yeah, and I'm like, do do your egos? Does your do your knees affect your your mouth? Because I didn't hear a grunt or anything. Sure, shit, man. We're talking about one, two, three, four. We're talking a six round drill, right? Hit one, move, hit hit those two, come back, hit. Uh, and with that, with him getting inside of here and me grunting, I think I beat my previous time by a second and a half on a six round drill. Yeah. Right. So both sides of the coin, right? That affected me both. Um, I have not uh, taken uh, Kid of uh, Busey's class. I hear yeah. that is good. Yeah. Um, I hear that's good. Um, and then next level, although they, you know, it's kind of hard to find them, would be uh, Max Michelle and JJ Ricasa. Yeah. Yeah. I really a big fan of the way Max Michelle moves too. You know, he's, there's no, I, I don't know if I have that pure, uh, you know, spider monkey on Mountain Dew speed like J.J. Ricasa does. I mean, that guy can really move. But Max yeah. is really efficient. Yeah. He, here's the thing about both of them. Is they'll tell you exactly how they do it. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah. you know, like like I always say, look, speed comes from efficiency. Efficiency comes from technique. If you can pour on the pure athleticism like J.J. can, uh, God bless you. Yeah. Right. But the thing is, the thing that I don't like is is the uh, hyper athlete that can't tell you what he's doing. Yeah. Then who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. I am never going to turn into a five foot seven Filipino guy, you know, who weighs a buck 60, 70. Yeah. So no, no offense, JJ. I don't know how much, we're, but you know, and even, and even Max isn't that big of a guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But he can, they can tell you how they move in every aspect of their movement. Mm-hmm. And that's their worth weight and goal. Because you may never be as fast as them, but sure as shit, you'll be faster than you were almost right. immediately than you were the day before you took the class. Right. You now, um, so those, yeah, those are the guys that I would, those are the guys that I would suggest. Um, but cool. again, the, the, the most available out there would probably be Tim Heron, uh, who has now gone full time instructor and just a wonderful guy. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. We need more like him. Absolutely. Hey, Interesting. Steve Anderson did the same thing to me. He used this word. He said, you're lethargic to get to the gun. Yeah. That's a word, man. I really don't like that word. You know, he said, your hands are very quick once you get going, but you're lethargic to get to the gun. You know, good teachers are able to find that one keynote thing like that, especially yeah. when you're talking about guys who've been training a lot, you know, and that makes a difference. And it's funny how that one thing sticks with you. And he got me to, you know, draw to steal at seven yards and transition to another one at 10 yards in one one uh because he said you're lethargic he didn't tell me i was slow you know yeah he addressed and, and, a personality issue <laughs> and, and those types of classes are amazing and even if you never want to compete i would suggest that you go train with tim train with steve train yep. with ben and stuff like that because it's an environment where it's okay to fail yeah Right. It's 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 OK to fail because only in, you know, uh, on our self-defense tactical side of classes, the general genre is that you cannot fail. Right. Otherwise, a black hole will open up <laughs> and out from it will appear lawyers and police and and all these other things. But if you look at any other, whether it's self-defense or sport or anything like that, I mean, if someone's like, hey, dude, uh, you need to get to a 300 pound bench but you can never fail. You would laugh at the guy and go, what the hell are you talking about, dude? How am I ever going to get there? Right. Where's your so, feedback? Yeah. Where's your feedback? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's my training partner going to do? Yeah. Mark my failure. My, what? what? I don't yeah. understand that. Report me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, dude. So awesome, man. Yeah. So I, I would look up those guys. I would add yep. anybody out there, man. Uh, I, I would suggest for them to, cause that's really the next level stuff. 
yeah you know on on, on things um okay man so we're at about 53 minutes in right so now comes the final uh you know favorite part of the uh, of the audience to show the get it off your chest segment of the show right so let me explain what that is right uh you know you can frame it around what do people need to start doing to get better what do people need to stop doing to get better or whatever else you want to talk about firearms related martial arts related don't talk about your neighbors nobody cares about your neighbors so. <laughs> god there's so many things uh you know one of the biggest things for me uh this goes to instructors um, become a professional instructor if you're going to teach other people learn how to communicate learn how to talk to people and actually enjoy talking to people and find out who they are I start every class the same way. I introduce myself. I ask them where they're from. I ask them what their background is. I shake their hand and I tell them together, we're going to make a better shooter out of you. And we're going to work together to do this. Uh, we are a team as an instructor and I can't let my side down by not being a professional instructor. So take other guys' classes, uh, study the idea of teaching any subject, study things outside of your field besides just who's got the coolest sight on their gun or who shoots the best time study how human beings work. Uh, there is a great depth of scientific knowledge of how to make better performing athletes. And it, it applies to all of us. Uh, that's for the instructors. Mm. For shooters, start engaging in deliberate mindful practice. Quit just doing things over and over and hoping you'll get a better result. You must be fully engaged in what you're doing. It doesn't matter how many reps you do, it matters how much you get out of each rep. And to your point before, failure and feedback is the necessary process of deliberate practice. If I don't get failure, I don't get any feedback. And if I'm not pushing that edge in dry practice and live practice, I'm never going to learn. All right. So quit making excuses with that. And don't worry about everybody else. The only person you have any control over is your improvement. Get better for yourself. Control the one thing you can, which is your own fundamental performance through deliberate practice. Uh, and I'm not talking about practicing hours a day. For the average shooter, five minutes, four or five times a week, three times a week would make a tremendous difference in their gun handling skills. Um, and seek out training from competent people. Um, and use your ability to discern what is a competent person. Uh, have they made better shooters? Is there, is there a group or work of knowledge that you can point to and say, those people are better? Uh, the problem with, with guns is outside of Tom Givens, we don't have anybody with a big body of groups of people that have gotten shootings as a citizen and won. Yeah. You know, he's got 64 uh, wins now, uh, you know, zero losses and what's two or three draws where they didn't carry a firearm. Yeah. So, three, three forfeits, yeah, I think he says. Yeah, three forfeits. So, uh, you know, that's somebody I can listen to in depth and perspective. And I would say for all of us, something that comes from martial arts is honor your elders. Mm -hmm. Um, Take the knowledge of the people that have gone before you. I'm really blessed. I get to sit and talk to Claude Warner every night, you know, mm -hmm. and I can run things past him. I had him audit my own class and write notes. And Claude is a meticulous guy, if you know him. He's the tactical professor. Mm -hmm. And he handed me some gems of knowledge to become a better instructor. And I don't see any difference between teaching and being a student at heart. Um, you've got to be in the process of getting better. We know from Japanese the word sensei meant the person that goes before it doesn't mean teacher. It's just somebody who went ahead of you. And you're going to find people of all ages, all sizes, um, all experience levels that can teach you. Um, if you only say this guy's good enough to teach me or I can't learn from him, you're holding yourself back. So get involved in deliberate practice. Instructors become better instructors. Uh, seek out knowledge. Uh, uh, talk among your, your peers and improve yourself and grow it. Uh, and you know, your time is running for all of us. We only got a limited amount of time, so get to work and quit messing around. Yeah, outstanding, man. Let me ask you one thing that's a derivative of, of what you just said. What do you, what are your thoughts on disagreeing with your mentors, with your teachers that came before you? Is that okay? <laughs> is it necessary? What do you think, man? It's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, growth comes from friction in, in the environment. And uh, different viewpoints, you know, I'm not involved in an organization anymore just for this reason, because the organization kept saying we can only go in this direction because it's easiest for us to keep it moving. Uh, the answers lie where the answers lie. And sometimes we can't see the whole picture. 
every one of us is very good in cer certain areas, but we have a blind spot. And the real portion is, you know, if I have a, I have an 18 year old black, black belt legitimately in my class, you know, he's not IBJJ black belt, but he's fighting in the absolute division and winning. So mm -hmm. that tells you something. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been training since he was three and a half. And he said something to me the other day and I was like, that's not right. Me. Well, you know what? That is right. So he became my teacher in that instant, you mm. know, and he disagreed with me and I've encouraged an environment of dissent so that we can grow. Yeah. Uh, that's the only way, you know, and when I mean dissent, I mean legitimate, Hey, listen, there's something here. Not, I don't like that. I don't want to do it. I think that's where people get confused. Yeah. You know, I just don't like what you're doing and I don't want to change is very different than, is there a better way to do something? And the or, only way we can do that is say, do it. Yeah. Or, 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 or the, uh, the old standby shield in the firearms industry. It works for me. Yeah. You know, what's that mean? <laughs> what does that <laughs> even mean? I love it when you say that because it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it does, when does like, it stop working? That's right. That is like, that's your, uh, like your political correctness for mm -hmm. right? Like, look, you're on the edge of offending me. Yeah. Right. I <laughs> like my 530 holster and <laughs> I can blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, bro, you can't, but that's yep. okay. You know, <laughs> you do you, you do. You. <laughs> awesome, man. So brother, where, where can people find you, man? In, in, in the entirety between, uh, like your martial arts school, uh, uh, the complete combatant YouTube, social media, throw it all out there, man. Cause people need yep. to start following you. Well, you know, I'm lucky to have a wonderful wife who supports my career choices. You know what that's like? Yes, uh, it's sir. a blessing. And she does all the stuff that I would let drop by the side. So we have a wonderful website, thecompletecombatant.com. Uh, we have Fusion Fitness and MMA.com. Uh, we do YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all the stuff. Um, there's endless amount of information coming out. Uh, so you can find anything you want. So just check out any one of those sites. They all lead back to each other. And all the information you need is there. Outstanding, man. And then one real quick thing. You're going to be at TACON 2020, right? Yes, sir. As am I, super honored. I think you I'm had excited. I, I think you had something yep. to do with that, and I appreciate that, man. Like, let me ask you a question, right? And I don't care because my podcast, I can do what I want to do. Uh, so during that time, will you as or me as an instructor there, will we have time to take other instructors' blocks? Yes, we time? will. Oh, awesome! I can't you only have a four-hour block, and you got three days of, of freedom, and you can go in. Oh, uh, there's only one four-hour block. Yeah, so you oh. just teach once, and you're good to go. One or f four or two, but I imagine you get four, and then the rest of the weekend is yours. Oh. So well, then you can the... apply kleptonesia. Yeah. Hey. You go steal hey. everybody's ideas. <laughs> you know, according to Ernest Langdon, right, I always quote him, the best teachers are the best thieves to maintain honor, give credit where credit is due. That's it. Right. Absolutely. Well, here's how hoping that our blocks are not at the same time, my friend. Yeah. I can't wait to take your, your, your block, man. So yeah. And I can't wait to train with you again. So awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Cause you're hosting me next year. Yeah. That'll go live here soon. We got the, uh, I got the green light from, uh, the, uh, CEOs of our company, our wives, <laughs> right. To go ahead and post that up. That's going to be yeah. exciting. That's going to be exciting. So listen, man, I, I super, super appreciate this, man. Uh, you know, again, I followed you before we kind of trained together and then, uh, after knowing you and, and, and just like watching the videos and the way you teach, man, it's, um, it's, uh, it is inspiring, man. Cause you just, you just dig it. You know, there's enough knife hand guys out there throwing their resumes out and like, you know, you don't need to get better because you're just taking my class and I'm doing supervised drilling yeah. and it's an honor for you. Whatever. That's that, that that's going by the wayside, man. So, again, uh, uh, thank you for being one of those awesome instructors out there that make people better. Um, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate what you do, too. Yeah. So let's uh, let's let, let me let me pay the bills now. Otherwise, yep. uh, the boss will get angry. So, guys, um, if you're digging this stuff, man, you know, uh, all this free milk and these awesome dudes I have uh, on the show. Do me a favor. Subscribe. Like, you know, the more that you do that, like because I get paid a big fat zero for doing this stuff. Uh, uh it lets other people know it gets in, it gets out there in the feeds and the searches and lets other people know about the message that we're trying to, uh, uh communicate. 
out there to the self, other self-reliant lifestyle people. Um, if you want to train with me, go to modernsamuraiproject.com, hit the classes button, and that'll take you to uh, the registration website. Um, you can find me, Modern Samurai Project, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Um, yeah, and do that. And guys, most importantly, man, wherever you can find good information, get out there, train, and because we all got to be good, stay safe, get training. Thank <laughs> you.